These ancient lords are said to be ghosts by the other folk dwelling in the Alma Basin and the Koireas Mountains today, but in truth they are incorporeal flying spirits who must expend life energy to even become visible. Welcome back folks to another Realms Lore video. Today we are going to be talking about something that not a lot of folks might know about, which is the Meriloy. I'm here with Ed Greenwood, original creator of the Forgotten Realms. Uh, do you want to fill us in a little bit, Ed? Sure. There, there are lots of bits of Realms Lore that for one reason or another end up being just a few lines in the lore, which means tons of people who play in the Realms, who read about the Realms go, what is that? And we don't know anything more about it. So. To the east of where most of us play in the realms, there is a mysterious race known as the Meriloi, or sometimes called spirit folk, or some of the people who live around them call them the ancient lords. We're going to find out all about them. If you're enjoying these videos, please be sure to like, subscribe, turn on notifications so you can know when the next one comes out. And also, please consider becoming a protector of the realms if you go to patreon.com slash edgreenwood. The support from the Patreon is what allows us to continue making these videos and more, and you'll get Discord rules, you'll get exclusive realms lore, tons of works in progress, and other cool stuff. So, please enjoy this realms lore video about the Meriloi. The Mysterious Meriloi. For centuries, there have been rumors and tales about a mysterious vanished race of people who once flourished in the northern wastes east of Faroon. Spirit folk, many of the tales called them, and there was universal agreement that they were tall, fair-haired and fair-skinned, and wielded powerful but unusual magic. Their settlements were in ruins, and they were seen no more, yet were not gone. Even sages can agree on little more than that beyond two names. The race called themselves the Meriloi, and other folk who dwell in the region now call them the Ancient Lords. Time, as Alminster is wont to say, for a little truth-telling. So, here we go. The Meriloi are a race of elves. Related to the Snow Elves, some say, but in truth, the origins of both the Meriloi and the Snow Elves have been forgotten, even by both peoples themselves, who long ago sought and achieved immortality and a relief from needs of the flesh, meaning food, water, the building of shelters, and the need for heat in cold weather and cooling in hot weather by evolving into an incorporeal or spirit form. It was this ascent, or evolution, accomplished by carefully developed spells of great power under the guidance of the deity Tarsalus Miunduin, that made iron, all ferrous metals, poisonous to the Meriloi, so that they made and used tools, weapons, and fasteners of bronze. The Lord of the Mountains, Tarsalus Miunduin, is an elven god of mountains, rivers, and the wilderness, and is the patron deity of both the Meriloi and Snow Elves. Known as the Lord of the Mountains, he appears as an eight-foot-tall, heroically muscled, tanned, white-skinned, blonde male elf with piercing sky-blue eyes, barehanded and clad in luxurious furs, always dusted with snow regardless of the temperature of his surroundings. From his bare palms, he can hurl waterfalls, water spouts, and ravening gusts of wind that can fell trees and hurl even gigantic creatures helplessly tumbling away. He is himself immune to heat, cold wind, lightning, and being harmed by natural forces such as avalanches, earthquakes, and flowing lava. He can walk upon quicksand and the surfaces of rivers and ponds as if such surfaces are solid ground. He seems to speak all known languages, and his symbol is a triangular gray bare stone mountain peak bisected by a vertical wavy blue line, a river. Tarsalis usually manifests not as his avatar, but by a rising moaning wind that heralds a bright racing blue-white radiant spear of wind that can shatter solid stone walls, rend armor, and smash any barrier if the deity so desires. 
He can summon any specific or all woodland creatures in a two-mile radius to obey him, and they will carry out his commands absolutely, even to their deaths, though Tarcellus cherishes non-evil wild creatures and will seek to avoid giving such commands. Thrice a day, he can summon an elemental of his choice of type, though the size and strength of the elemental will be random, to serve him and he can immediately command any elemental within his line of sight, even if it has been sent against him. Tarsalis can't summon or compel Meriloy, but any in the presence of either his avatar or his manifestation will leap to aid him or carry out what they believe to be his will or desires. This is because in aiding their ascent, Tarsalis gained the Meriloy as steadfast, devoted worshippers. They know he wanted a better life for them, and they venerate him above all others and seek to follow his likes, dislikes, wants, and aims for themselves. Meriloy, who do Tarsellus sufficient service in life, become pearls in his memory, which means that if they are slain, they can reform in a matter of months, come back to life whole and unharmed with all of their memories, Wherever in Ferun Tarsellus desires them to appear, he will usually honor their preferences about this. The Meriloi Today In their current forms, the Meriloi are seven to nine feet tall, white wraith-like flying or hovering spirits. However, when they arouse their innate magic for battle, they turn a glowing light blue and levitate upwards a few feet to 70 feet aloft, or more, the height being as they prefer or as surroundings permit, to spin rapidly, upright in space, hurling forth spells with accurate aim, not wildly in random directions, as they whirl. These ancient lords are said to be ghosts by the other folk dwelling in the Alma Basin and the Koiraz Mountains today, but in truth they are incorporeal flying spirits who must expend life energy to even become visible and far more energy to become tangible thanks to the unique to them magical path they've taken to extend their lives, achieve undeath if you will. As becoming corporeal costs them so much life energy, the Meriloi prefer to possess living bodies which they enter and experience life vicariously through, silently conferring the following benefits by their very presence. Their host can sense active enchantments and hung or waiting enchantments, such as explosive runes, invisible glyphs, and other magical traps nearby, and they can choose to entirely absorb magic directed at their host, so their host isn't affected by it. They can remain within a falling host and confer a featherfall-like property, and they can heal a host body by expending their own life energy, or depart and drift like a ghost into a new host they like better. They will avoid hosts who wear, carry, or use iron and other ferrous metal tools, weapons, or armor. Most Meriloi won't hesitate to enter a host body, willingly or unwillingly, and they seem to have no ethical problems with doing so, but some Meriloi have been known to respect a host's wishes when they resent or fear being entered and make this clear. It's not known by what precise means an unwilling being can resist, expel, or bar a Meriloi from entering them, but mastery of arcane and divine magic and or the presence of iron and active magic items on or borne by a potential host clearly caused Meriloi to keep away from that potential host. According to Elminster, the Meriloi are wise, experienced folk with a limited to the lands they prefer to dwell in, but deep and thorough understanding of the world. They obey their own elders, and in particular, the political leaders and magically powerful elders whom they collectively refer to as the true. Meriloi are immune to life energy drain, whether magic or via natural creature abilities. Their, their nature scrambles such attempts to simply fail, but they can still be drained of blood and other bodily fluids, and they can suffer harm at point damage. Meriloi Magic Meriloi use unique magic, 
arcane spells that draw on the weave, but make use of substances and formats not normally harnessed by others. One of these is weep work castings, wherein Meriloy combine their own tears with the blood of creatures to create a clear liquid they can teleport unerringly to once it's spilled on stones or other non-organic, non-ferrous surfaces. This is why the Pazruki won't possess Meriloy relics, for fear Meriloy will teleport to them at will, repeatedly appearing unheralded. Another is Tharvran, or Enchanted Mud. The Meriloy mix dirt with their own spittle, blood, or tears, enchant it, and smear it on their faces, on doors or thresholds or hinges, and specific floor stones, stumps, or tree trunks. They can then cast various hostile spells into the mud to hang there, waiting for a Meriloy spoken command or a magic mouth-like set of specific trigger conditions which when met, caused the hung spells to erupt out of the mud, disintegrating the mud and affecting surroundings with targets or an aimed area effect set in the trigger conditions. It's known that most Meriloy can work spells that create, shape and aim winds as attacks, and that a specific Meriloy spell delivered by touch forces a shape-shifted being after a round of helpless struggling back into the form it had at birth for an entire round. Meeting Meriloy. Despoil not their ruins, including underground labyrinths, and venture not into their lands, Elminster says, and you'll likely never meet with the Meriloy. They seem to have little interest in the wider world, except when the Lord of the Mountains does. They seem to have a love for the land and practice guardianship over it, much as their patron deity Tarcellus does. Elminster believes they pursue other collective interests, but is unwilling or unable to be more specific. And that's more about the Meriloy than many a bard or sage can tell you. Hi, welcome back to Realm Speak. This time around, we're doing this. Redansir. Yes, Redansir. No, it's not Red and Sire. Although, you know, there are merchants from far away who will say that if they're reading it off a map. If they're just trying to navigate there, they'll always say Redan's here. Because that's what they've heard. So they're asking for the place they've heard. Redan's here. And I know this is correct because I created this place like all of the other places. Redan's here. 